when somebody's really tuned in and they just follow their instincts and their intuition and things work out much easier for them. Everybody knows that when you get some nagging thought and you don't listen to it and then, you know, you always regret later that you're like, oh, I should have should have listened to that. That was my intuition screaming at me. So hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Unpacking Possibility. I'm your host, Tracy Stein. As always, I'm so happy to be here with you today. Today's guest is amazing. She's wonderful on every level. You will be fascinated as you learn more about Pam Coronado. Now, I've known Pam Coronado for quite a while now, but for those of you just getting to know her, Pam is many things. She's a mother. She is an author. She's a psychic detective. She is a teacher. Pam's done, honestly, things that um, really are just incredible, and I can't wait for her to tell you more about them. She has done everything from been on the long-running series on the Discovery Channel, Sensing Murder, where she was a psychic detective. She's worked with law enforcement on a number of cases of missing persons and even some quite a bit more unnerving than that, if you can believe it. Pam has done a live remote viewing session on Oprah. It's still Googleable. You should check it out. She is the first female president of the International Remote Viewing Association and the current vice president, I believe, Pam, right? I retired. Um, I'm no she's longer in, the current vice president. Ah, okay. But she's done it. And Pam's been a longstanding advocate for the families of missing persons, um, without further ado, rather than me telling everybody about you, Pam, welcome to the show. Um, I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I have to warn all the viewers that I have two dogs and they were asleep until a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> they were both happily asleep until just a minute ago. So if you hear a lot of clicking sounds in the background, that would be the dogs running around. So. Um, <laughs> Hopefully they'll. Mine might make an appearance too. Yes, this is when they decide to wrestle and and all of that. So, uh, so anyway, if you're dog lovers out there, hopefully uh, you won't mind. (laughs) Right. If and the non-dog lovers, well, they're probably not right for the show anyway. (laughs) We're very pet oriented here. We are. We are. We are animal people. Yes. Yeah. So Pam, you have, you know, I want, to, I want you to share a little bit about your story um, because it's really an incredible one. Because even though I know you've always been intuitive, you really did not, it's not like you went to school to study how to be a psychic detective. You had kind of an interesting journey here. Right. Um, so maybe start with a little bit of background about that. Yeah. I actually, I have always been intuitive but I didn't realize that I was intuitive. So I wasn't one of those kids who sat in my room and, and, you know, saw angels or talked to dead people. I didn't do any of that as a kid. Um, So I didn't think I was any different than anybody else, but it wasn't until I was a mom. I had three kids. I was married, uh, cats, dogs, you know, the whole chaotic lifestyle. Um, (laughs) And I, you know, I think that the kids were very young. So I had, four kids in three years. So I had, uh, it was a circus. And um, so I started having dreams, lots and lots of dreams. And I kept thinking that I was just hormonal or something was wrong. I thought I was kind of, you know, losing it a little bit, (laughs) that there was too much (laughs) chaos and I was a little, uh, maybe it was just hormones, but I started having all these dreams night after night. And they were all kind of frightening and and crime related. And that is not something that I was interested in before. You know, I was going to school to become an architect. And um, I, so (laughs) I, I don't know why I was having all of these dreams, but then I started noticing that they were actually corresponding to things I'd see in the newspaper. So I'd have the dream. And then the next day, you know, I'd see this thing in the newspaper and go, huh, that's weird. But then it turned out I had the one dream that changed my life. And that was, I dreamed that I was a woman 
Um, and I was riding around in the back seat of a car with my husband and her mistress, apparently his mistress. But in the dream, you know, he turned around, he glared at me, but it wasn't my, my life. It wasn't my husband, but I knew that was my husband in the dream and that this was his girlfriend and that they were going to do something that I knew I was in grave danger. Um, and I, you know, glanced out the window, we were driving down this curvy road and I was in the back seat of the car and I glanced out a window and I see this angel flying out the side of the window and she's kind of motioning for me to come with her. And I'm thinking, yep, that I'd rather go with her than whatever's getting ready to happen here. <laughs> um, so next thing I know, I'm doing the Peter Pan style. I'm flying along with her and I'm looking back down at the car and I can see the car. I can see the road, all that stuff. Um, and then I end up in a place that I can only say is my, uh, my understanding of heaven from when I was going to school church as a kid right so I wake up I was like that was the most profound weird dream ever I write it down and at that time I wasn't even studying this stuff really but I knew that if you had a really profound dream you should write it down and then probably about three days later I look in the newspaper and I'm shocked to see we still had newspapers then <laughs> I was shocked <laughs> to see that um the uh, man in my dream, there was a big article saying that a woman was missing. And this man in the dream, it was his picture staring at me from the newspaper. And I just, my whole world just sort of shifted because <laughs> I was like, okay, I can't pretend this isn't, this is not a coincidence. This is real. This man and his girlfriend are uh, suspects and his wife is missing. And, oh my gosh, I think I know where she is, uh, based on some of the dream stuff. So, um, so I said nothing. I did nothing, said nothing. I didn't want people to think I was, uh, you know, crazy. Um, <laughs> so. But you weren't. <laughs> um, I really just didn't want to say anything. And then eventually... Um, I saw the mother and the grandmother on the news and they were crying and asking for somebody to come forward and help them. And I just couldn't stand it anymore. So I did go down and I volunteered for the search party and long story, really long story, but we did find her. Uh, we did find her that day and that changed, obviously changed my whole path. <laughs> it was, and so it was, what you're saying is you found you and the search party found the body of this missing woman yeah i wasn't the husband... with them i wasn't with them actually at the time i was with a different group because we were going in all these different directions but they had taken the information i gave them put it up on a, a big huge map in an rv and they had highlighted all the areas that matched what i was telling them and then they just were sending groups out to all of those places but what's funny about it is that i was praying i was praying so hard I was like, look, I will, I will help. I'll do everything I can, but please don't make me find a body today. I'm not ready to find a body yeah. today. Um, and it worked out perfectly because we found her, but I didn't have to find her myself, uh, you know. But how overwhelming, um, and, and we're going to get, I, I want to get to your work with dreams in a little bit, but you know, you you had these dreams. You did not want to have these dreams. You did not know why you were having them. This yeah. was so specific. And it got to the point where your conscience wouldn't let you just keep this very vivid and prophetic dream to yourself. Right. Um, and because of the information you provided to law enforcement, the search parties were able to find her that day. Correct. Tell me if I'm remembering this incorrectly, but were you in a situation where a detective brought you to the home yes. of this woman? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that because I find this very unnerving, but I actually think you have some sort of divine protection because of all the work you've done. The fact that we're still talking and you're right. in the physical makes me very happy. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. The detective, um, 
it's it's kind of funny now looking back on it because I kept telling him, I'm not a psychic. I don't know what I'm doing. I just had a dream. I don't know how to do this. But I had seen people on TV hold objects. <laughs> so I was like, well, maybe if I hold an object, um, I don't remember what they were after. Uh, more information on, you know, who did this, why they did this and all of that, I guess. Um, so they did take me to his house and much to my horror, um, he came walking out and I had to be face to face with him. And the husband who was the, the actual murderer was of murdering her. And that, that, uh, that encounter was really intense and very scary. And, um, he said things to me that were super disturbing and, and something snapped in me and I got over being scared and got mad and, um, uh, said, you know, don't worry, sir, we're going to find your wife. <laughs> um, and he, um, you know, he's always blamed me, actually. He's always blamed me because he, he was of the idea that no body, no crime. So he's always blamed me that we found her instead of, you know, himself or actually harming his wife. But um, but he he kind of cornered me, you know, in the house away from the detectives. And he kept trying to get me away from them and into uh, someplace where I'd be cornered. And, you know, and he said, he said, um, you'll never find her. She's too deep, which, um, you oh know, my God. which stopped my heart for a moment. And, and then I thought, oh my gosh, I'm telling him the wrong thing. I'm wrong. I'm telling him the wrong place. And I've got 200 people out there. And then I got really centered and I went, wait a minute, he's just trying to throw you off. And don't listen to this guy. And it turns out she was deep. She was, what happened was when you're in, intuitive, for me, dreams, my depth perceptions messed up. So what looked like a ravine to me, it looked like a little ditch, really. I thought it was a ditch um, off the side of a road. And turns out that she was 30 feet down in this ravine. So um, that's what he was talking about was that she was 30 feet down. But the reason we found her is because we found her shoe up at the top of the, they had accidentally left her shoe up at the top and we found the shoe. So, and this really, this few day journey following all of these dreams started you on this really unexpected and incredible path. I'm going to call it a path of service. Yeah. Um, and a path of service that I think even most intuitives are not cut out for. Correct. You are a mom, you are an animal lover, you are a nice person, but you are one of your many gifts with this is not only that you're so accurate, but you're able to compartmentalize in a way that I think protects you from the horror of a lot of the cases that you've worked on. Now, it took me a long time to get there. <clears throat> you know, I was pretty sheltered and and uh, naive and all of that stuff when I first started and really wasn't interested in crime even. Uh, but I found out I had a really good knack for it that I just tended to think that way. And I was good at it. But <clears throat> for me, it was that first family. What, what changed everything for me was that first family when they hugged me and they thanked me for bringing their daughter home, however that turned out, um, I know. And they sent me Christmas cards every year forever. Um, it, and that connection um, was just like, this is it. I finally found my thing that, that I feel like I can really make a difference for people who are suffering and that was my goal all along because I never really loved the crime aspect part, but I loved the idea that I could be there for somebody who was in such extreme trauma because, you know, if I was in that situation, I certainly would want somebody um, to help me if they had the ability. So um, that's what sort of set me off on that 
on that path. I was reluctant. I'll tell you, I was reluctant <laughs> from day one. Um, but I understood the path of service part. And that's what's kind of driven me the whole time. And it really, truly is. Um, you know, and it's something I think a lot of people wouldn't think about psychic detective work as a cert, like a path of service and a calling. Yeah. But, you know, between finding missing people and and also stopping, you know, really scary people in their tracks, right. providing... And again, I just want to clarify for people listening who are unfamiliar with this, you're not going out trying to stop the serial killer yourself, right? hopefully. You are right. providing information based yeah. on your intuition that has helped stop future crimes and, and, and solve current ones. Right. So I'm just a tool. <clears throat> I, I laugh. That's an ongoing joke. Don't call me a tool, but I am um, just a tool. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Wait till you take a drink. Um, <laughs> don't call me a tool. Um, but um, I, know you're cut. I, um, I am just a tool, you know, for law enforcement. I'm just another part of the investigation. I'm not, you know, I don't come in with the cape and say, I'm here to save the day. You know, I am, I am, me? I'm here to not, provide. And that's not how you are at all. Yeah. I'm here to provide uh, whatever information I can provide. And then it's, they still have to, to do the boots on the ground, you know, investigate. They still have to be the ones sitting in court with evidence and all of that. So I definitely don't take over credit other than, you know, giving them some direction and giving them, uh, some new investigative leads. That's how I look at and, it. And I and I imagine your approach, one of humility and service and and knowing what your role is and isn't, has made you especially attractive for law enforcement to seek you out. Right? Because you're not going to newspapers saying, I'm working on this high profile crime. Am I getting this right? You worked on the Beltway sniper case. Yeah. Yeah. Can you and I, and I know your work has shifted more away from crime, and I really want to get to that as well. But just for background, can you give a little synopsis of that? Because that was pretty incredible. And I remember that case when it was happening. Yeah, I got involved what, <clears throat> you know, as the story unfolded, I started training and learning how to to get a handle on my abilities. So I started practicing and that's how I learned remote viewing and um, all of that stuff to teach myself how to be better at what I did so I could be of better service to people who needed me. And in that process, um, I met a woman named Beverly Jagers and she was working, she trained me, she took me under her wing and she had a group of, of cops that she was training to do uh, psychic work, which I thought was fascinating. So she threw me in there with that group. <laughs> and um, that's how I learned. But um, but somehow in there, um, she was contacted by the FBI um, on a pretty high profile case. And so she wasn't really physically able to go and work on that. And I was her promising, her promising student. So she sent me, um, because I do go out in the field and I do search. I still, 26 years later, I'm still searching. I, I'm search certified now. So I still do search. Um, but she sent me to this, to this very high profile case in DC to work with the FBI, which was you know, a mind blowing, um, scary, intimidating, everything you can think of situation. And, um, and from there I made that connection and then I continued to work on cases, you know, with them. So that was, um, how the beltway sniper thing came about because that happened, started happening, of course. And, um, it was just a natural conversation to ask me, you know, what I thought and what was happening and, and, um, and all of that. And of course it was such an intense, you, you, 
uh, I'm sure remember <laughs> how intense it was for a very short period. Um, and, and so can I you was just looking at it remind people of that case? Because it was two people, right? Uh -huh. A father and son? No, it was um, right. Lee Maldo oh. uh, and, um, oh gosh. Uh, Sorry, an older man and a younger man. Yeah. yeah. It was taking they, people out. Yeah, they were. Um, he, the older man was acting as a father figure for this boy, this younger boy. Um, and the, um, they, you know, they were just going around randomly shooting people. So they, um, I don't In remember. In the DC area. Got like 17 or, or something like that. But, um, you know, it was terrifying the whole Beltway area because you never knew where they were and they were shooting at people at gas stations and people were afraid to get gas and they were like hiding behind their cars when they were trying to get gas. And it was just this crazy scene in the DC area. And so they were, you know, trying to figure out what was their motive, what were they doing? And, and it was an interesting case because they were leaving behind these bizarre clues. So they were leaving behind these really strange clues. And I understood that all of a sudden that they had some sort of metaphysical knowledge, um, which was odd because I got the man's name and I got the name Muhammad, um, which was really confusing for me because <laughs> I was like, what is happening? Um, but they did have, they did have some, um, metaphysical knowledge and they were throwing down tarot cards at the scenes and leaving these cryptic messages and notes for the detectives to find. And, and so of course, you know, uh, it was a real X-Files kind of thing where, the detectives had no idea what was going on, what these guys were doing, what they were thinking. And, and so uh, we were having those conversations kind of about what, what they were trying to do and try to accomplish and all of that. It's so interesting too, because I think, you know, what people might listening might not yet realize is that you were picking up on things that were not common knowledge. They were not public knowledge. Right. You know, not only about what um, the snipers were doing, but their motivation and their intentions and their plan. The plan. And yeah. And and knowing the plan, tuning into the plan enabled you to help law enforcement to, you know, to provide them with information that helped them to intercept and stop this killing spree. Not that really. was really paralyzing. <laughs> that, that's the nation. a little overreach. But yeah. But well, <laughs> But uh, all right, definitely correct me. But it was definitely, you know, it was definitely I was trying to get one step ahead of them. And and I could tell you what they were going to do next. I couldn't tell you exactly where, but I could tell you what they were going to do next. So I kind of knew. You know, and I was trying to advise. But remember, this was a huge case and there were way too many cooks in the kitchen. There were so many jurisdictions involved and so many detectives involved. And so it wasn't like I was talking to the head guy, you know? Um, so there was a lot of different agencies. It was, uh, even that made the whole scene just super chaotic because there were so many different agencies involved, but, you know, it was trying to, trying to get ahead of them and what to say, because I knew they were reacting to what was happening on the news. So it was, you know, try to advise a little bit on what to say and not say and things like that. But, you know, I made a critical error in that case and I learned something really valuable from it, but I made a critical error in that case in that I, I, because on the news everywhere, they said, you know, we're looking for a white box truck. I assumed that's what it was and I didn't even bother to look. So I just thought, well, we're looking for a white box truck. And it turns out that that was um, wrong. <laughs> they were looking for a blue car. And um, I wish that I had, I wish that I had taken the time to look at that and question, you know, what they were, 
what they were searching for there, because that might have made a difference earlier. But um, because they were hanging around after the shooting, they were hanging around. They would even pull up um, to people who were blocking traffic and say, what happened here? What's going on? So they were hanging around after some of those shootings, but nobody's paying any attention because they're not looking for a blue car. And just back to what you said a few moments ago is that, and this is not that unusual, the, 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 the people perpetrating this horrific crime were watching the news. So mm -hmm. you're advising law enforcement of what to say and what not to say was helpful in, in a different way than saying they're going to be here next Tuesday, right? Yeah. Or, you know, these are their intentions. Just knowing the fact that, you know, law enforcement had an opportunity yeah. to shape maybe how they, what their next move was by what they did and didn't say was, I think, invaluable. And yeah. I really like that you said, you know, I, I made an error here and I learned something. Yeah. Because I think a lot of times when people think about, I think you're one of the best intuitives out there. And I'm not just saying no. that, you know, and I, I don't think I'm the only person who thinks that. Um, you have a great track record. You're so meticulous. You're so thoughtful about how you go about um, tuning in and providing information. You're really honest about what you're not sure about. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people think that if you're a great intuitive, that you know everything and also that life will never bring you any surprises. <laughs> and I don't think that's the way it's meant to be. Right. Um, right. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, we've had that. I've had that conversation a lot. And uh, people are like, <laughs> well, you should always make perfect decisions. No, I don't think it works that way. Um, obviously, you know, how am I going to grow if I just totally see the roadmap ahead of me all the time and there's never any, any figuring life out. But, um, I definitely, um, sometimes turn into other, other intuitive folks to get some insight myself. It's hard, you know, we call it the slow snow globe effect. It's really difficult to see your own stuff sometimes when you're in it, when you're sitting in the middle of it. So it's nice to get perspective, you know, from outside of that. So I definitely uh, do make mistakes. I try to learn. I think that's what I, I'm big on uh, is not beating yourself up when you make a mistake is you learn from it, you grow from it, you use it to your advantage next time. Um, you know, and that's, that's the way I teach students all the time is don't get upset if you get something wrong. What's the takeaway? What did you learn from that? And you're going to, you're always going to learn more from your mistakes than what you got right. You get something Absolutely. right and you go, that was cool. But how did that, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> but when you make a mistake, you, you can see how it happened and you can understand why you did it. And then you can correct it going forward. Absolutely. And I, and I, you know, I know you, you are a, a very accomplished spiritual teacher. And, and, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking like the spiritual lesson for us is very often like we have our lessons that we're supposed to learn. Like you said, that's when we're growing. I, so I've taken a number of classes with you, not in a while. Um, yeah. We're going to talk more in a moment about the classes that you teach and the other services you provide and what you have coming up. So one of your students who actually was much better <laughs> in your psychic detective courses than I was, I, re I am not cut up, out for it. I am aware of what I'm good at and what I'm not. That is not the lane I'm supposed to be in. And that's totally okay. Yeah. But I believe it was Melissa Morgan who had you on her show a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember listening to that episode and being riveted. Yeah, just generally, but also by and you you can talk about this or not talk about it, totally up to you. Um, but by something where, for whatever reason, you were not, I'm going to say permitted by the universe or whatever to see, you know, what was the specifics of what a, this person in your professional life 
was up to. So I don't know if you want to talk about that or not. I remember being on the edge of my seat driving, listening to this podcast episode. Right. And being I'm like, oh my God, what you're talking about. I know, um, um, I'm trying to think what you're talking about. So I'm going to tell you. So yeah. it, it was like the TV producer guy oh. who turned out to be uh -huh. a really bad guy. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And you had feelings but like yeah. didn't, nobody showed you like the movie of what was going to unfold and i think there are yeah. reasons for that okay so what you're talking about now yeah totally up to you <laughs> yeah yeah it's fine um what i i attribute that to is that when i'm working on crime cases my mind that's where my mind is going you know as i'm suspicious i'm you know checking everything out and trying to figure it out but when i'm going around in my normal everyday life i'm not that way right so when i'm doing business with somebody i'm thinking about them in business terms i'm not thinking about them in criminal terms so yeah of um, course. i'm not really assessing them for is this a hidden is this a hidden criminal or you know is this just <laughs> somebody i'm trying to create a tv show with right <laughs> so um so I don't have my detective hat on all the time. Um, fairly I should, but um I think I've learned that lesson now. My dog's saying hello. Uh, Hi. <laughs> so um apparently I've learned that lesson now is you know, I probably need to be assessing people a lot uh more often. But um this particular thing that you were talking about was a producer who I was going to be doing a missing persons show with we our agents threw us together and um we didn't particularly hit it off really well I wasn't afraid of him I just you know we were kind of like magnets that repelled and we were trying to create a missing person show and I know that he had a format in mind of a show that he wanted it to be like this show called Locked Up Abroad. And I'll never forget this um, because it was like a first person account where somebody would sit there and talk about their experience of what they did wrong and how they ended up in jail and this whole thing. So fast forward, our relationship sort of deteriorates. <laughs> as we try to work together um and but we had had a lot of conversations about missing persons work and where people hide bodies you know we had had those conversations and um i i got out of my contract with him i was so uncomfortable and that was a hard thing i actually had to get a lawyer involved and it you know get out of my contract with him and that's when I kind of saw a side of him. I went, hmm, what is that? That's not uh, nice. But um, years later, this was a few years later, I was at home doing chores, and I think the news was on in the background. I don't do that anymore, by the way. <laughs> um, the news was on in the background, and I hear his name. I hear his name come on the news, and I'm like, I run in there to see what's going on and I go in there and I see that he has murdered his wife um, abroad, abroad in Mexico. He took her to Mexico on the guys that he wanted to repair their marriage and he killed her and hit her body in the sewage system of the hotel. Um, and you know, long story short, he ended up locked up abroad, which I always thought was like really ironic. Um, and he ended up filming himself. He ended up doing his own like documentary oh series while he was locked up in Mexico. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's such a crazy story because it made yeah. international headlines. I remember, and I forget the guy's name, Bruce Beresford but, Redford, Bruce Redmond Beresford or Bruce, whatever, Bruce Beresford Redmond or something like that. It's definitely Googleable. And you got a feeling that this was not somebody you wanted to work with. It just yeah. never felt right for the yeah. only time in your life you 
got a lawyer to get out of this contract because yeah. this guy repelled you. This is what you're saying. Like a yeah. magnet that repels. I don't but think he likes me would... either. I think he, he wanted to pick my brain, obviously, but I don't, th I, I always felt this distance between, you know, between us that he wasn't comfortable with me either. But I mean, I, I always, it's so interesting because, you know, as a psychologist, like I've said this to people, like, like psychopaths leak, they, mm -hmm. they leak, they can't be a hundred percent. They're they're so good at concealing who they are a lot of the time, but there's like little cracks and little leaks and, and you felt that right away. And yeah. honestly, I don't think it would have done any good for you to see a few years into the future about a crime he had not, he might or might not have even been planning yet. Right. But you got the information you needed to get out of that relationship. But the, but the yeah. whole idea is that it's not that you're never going to encounter anybody <laughs> who's off because right. of your psychic powers, you know, that's not the way it's supposed yeah. to unfold. Yeah. And my guard was down. Like I said, my guard was down because it was out of context. It wasn't in the whole, I'm assessing this person for criminality. You know, it, it was just a thing where we were thrown together in business, but my spidey senses weren't firing at all, on all cylinders, but they were certainly firing enough that I was like something. I just, I'm one of those people. I like everybody. I really like every, almost everybody. <laughs> I, you know, I, it, you'd have to be really bad for me to not, not <laughs> find something redeemable in there. So I, I tend to like people, but there was something about this guy. It's very rare for me to be turned off by somebody where I feel repelled. And, um, that was definitely the case with him, but did I foresee, you know, what it, not in my wildest dreams, would I foresee what, you know, that ended up to be. And, and it wouldn't like have been said, a, I mean, he may not have been, I don't know if he was at that point, if he was already, you know, calculating and thinking of that, or if it was uh, something that came later, who knows? I mean, you, and you couldn't have done anything about it at that point, even right. if you did. Right. So I feel like there's a wisdom to the universe. You know what I'm saying? Your work has shifted as of late to more teaching. You have a book, you, um, you know, you have the work you do, you do with families, um, you have incredible things coming up. So I would love for you to talk about how your work has shifted and the things you're really excited about. Okay. I, one of the, one of my things, which I'm hoping is kind of my, my legacy to this field is I'm working on a book with a co-author um, on um, it's for law enforcement who want to uh, navigate the world of working with psychics, whether they want to or don't want to, it's always in their face. <laughs> so um, really how to bring out the best in people and how to kind of um, navigate that complicated situation so that's something that I feel is really important for the field in general to help both sides, help the intuitives that want to work in law enforcement and help law enforcement who are trying to understand how this whole thing works. So that I feel is uh, something that I really, really want to um, leave behind in the, in the field. I was uh, telling you that I am, um, you know, I'm never going to walk away from um, missing person cases, probably it's just in my blood, you know, I can't, um, uh, seem to escape it. I'm really good at it. And, and I just am so moved by these cases. It just drives me crazy when they don't have anybody to help them. But I also, um, have been for years trying to broaden out more, um, and, you know, really reach out to more people who aren't interested in the crime thing, who, but there's so much value in just developing your intuition that I want to um, really reach a broader audience and reach all those people who can, you know, gain some 
it's really, really important to have that connection going in your life to help guide you. And, um, of course it's like you said, it's not perfect and you're still going to make mistakes and things, but, but to really have that guidance and to know you're not alone and to know that, that there's some divine wisdom and all you have to do is learn how to tune into it and how uh, helpful and useful it is to live kind of a guided lifestyle, which is what I call it. You know, when somebody's really tuned in and they just follow their instincts and their intuition and things work out much easier for them. Everybody knows that when you get some nagging thought and you don't listen to it. And then, you know, you always regret later that you're like, Oh, I should have, should have listened to that. That was my intuition screaming at me. So um, I really am, am broadening out to teaching more spiritual content, uh, helping people understand their soul purpose and and sort of the bigger picture of what we're doing here. And, and all of that stuff, you know, makes me very happy to see people grow into their own, their own spiritual selves. So I really, you know, moving in that direction quite a bit and I find it really rewarding and fun. I really like those um, kinds of classes. So I've been doing a lot of that, just um, trying to get people to really, really embrace their spiritual self and, and understand their potential. Cause I, you know, there's a lot of people that don't understand how much potential they have truly, truly. That's really so that's beautiful. Good. Yeah. That's one of my big so uh, goals for this year. <laughs> you have workshops coming up. I know you have classes and recordings that are on demand that people can find on your website, which is pamcoronado.com. Yeah. But you also have some live things coming up, um, including one with John Holland, who's, yeah. I love that you call him Johnny. <laughs> it's He's like, like you, you two have that. such a beautiful yes, rapport. <laughs> He's like, you're like the only two people in the world that are allowed to call me that. <laughs> so um, um, another incredible um, psychic medium. Um, so talk a little bit about what's yeah. coming up with John. Yeah, John. So John and I, John and I are doing a workshop in March. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's for those people that I was just talking about, really. We're, we're aiming for those people who want to want to open themselves up to intuition and um and that awareness and um open up to their clairvoyance and all of that so john and i a lot of people have taken our classes together um but you know we have a certain dynamic that you know i think is pretty funny so we do have fun when we teach together and we try to make it very fun and and light and yet people learn a ton. So, um, we are, we only teach together maybe once a year. So it's, it's, it's not that common. So, um, that is coming up in March. It's up on his website. It's up on my website too. And, um, those things fill up too. Those things fill up fast. So we've sold out on several of those that we've done in the past, but, uh, we, you know, John is a um, Hay House author and he's a well-known uh, medium and he's amazing how he stands up. See, everybody wonders how I do what I do, but I look at him and go, how do you stand up in front of four or 500, 600 people and, you know, do mediumship up there, uh, keep your cool and stay funny and all the things that he does. <laughs> Um, he's just brilliant at it. <laughs> that would just, yeah. that would, I would be totally unnerved by that, but he's amazing. So we, we love to, you know, uh, combine our forces and, and do that about once a year or so. This is such a, such a great combo. Uh, I, I have done two trainings with him, not in a long time, but he, you're absolutely right. He is funny and engaging and uncanny and he can stand up there and come up with details that are just so out there that you would say what is he talking about and then you're like oh my god no one they're, they're not googleable things yeah. um yeah and, he's hilarious uh, and i don't think people realize is. how funny he is um in his in his delivery you know he's 
he could be a stand-up comedian, I swear, sometimes. <laughs> but he's he's very funny, but he's very good. And he's uh, one of the things that we connect on, which is really interesting. You wouldn't really think it or put it together, but we uh, have the same theory. In like, I'm very detailed in the work I do. I have to be very detailed. Yeah. I can't just tell a detective I see a body near water because they're all going to giggle. They're all going to go, of course you do. <laughs> It's not right. that helpful. That's not helpful. Um, but if I say, you know, <clears throat> it's um, it's clear, it's cold, it's clean, it's flowing in one direction, it's definitely a river, um, you know, I can't uh, cross it on foot. It, anything like that is is, now they know you're not just making up random water. And so... John has the same kind of um, thing where he doesn't just say, oh, you got a tattoo in honor of your loved one because, you know, the odds of that are high. He'll say what the tattoo is. He'll say it's a butterfly. So that's we have that same kind of it has to be detailed enough that it gets their attention and they go, wow, OK, this is real. And just for people who have not yet taken a class with you or had a reading with you, because you do do intuitive readings and mediumship readings, and people can book those with you online. I've done many of them, and they're great. Um, you, one of the things I remember from your classes in terms of the detail that you try, you teach people to be really specific. Yeah, is um, everything mm -hmm. from recognizing the make and model of cars. So, you know, what's the hood ornament look like? And I know nothing about cars and I thought, <laughs> holy cow, the fact if you can, if there's like, I don't know, what, 50 different, you know, hood ornaments and you can pick out the one and it's accurate, or you can pick out the paint color, or you can pick out something distinctive about the landscape around where somebody will be found, or you can learn how to tune into a very specific direction. Right. So much more helpful. And, and it, this is trainable. Everybody's not going to be you. Most people aren't going to be working at that level, but like you and John are at the level you're at, not only because of your innate abilities, but because you have worked really hard. This has been a discipline for you. Yeah. Over years. And you share a lot of what you've learned how to do mm -hmm. with the people who take your classes. Um, yeah, it's true. And we, but we, we make it fun and we make it playful and less because the more stressed out people get, the more they try really hard and they, they're afraid of getting it wrong. The more they're, you know, I was like, are you afraid of getting it wrong? And they said, yeah, I'm like, you're going to get it wrong. <laughs> uh, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy it is you have to you know be curious and I think for me I've always had that approach where I wasn't taking it personally I was always curious about how does this work how do I make it better how, what's what are we actually capable of so I've always been really curious with it and I think when and I think John has that same thing where he's constantly kind of wanting to grow and see what we're capable of and 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 all of that and so it's more about that of of um, staying open and allowing yourself to be vulnerable which is a huge thing when it comes to doing this work huge having to be vulnerable and let yourself make mistakes and and all of that and um, like I said not shut down and go, well, I can't do this because I messed that one up. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. Absolutely. Pam, other things coming up that you'd like to share that you want people to know about? Yeah, I have a very, um, this is coming in February. It's very soon. Uh, most people wow. have never heard of this. This is only for the remote viewer world out there. But, you know, I have an ERV course coming up. Uh, it's sold out so extended already, but remote we're still, viewing. The, the online one is still open um, for people who want to learn with the two original military guys who were trained by the government how to do this. So um, I have that ERV. It's called extended remote viewing. 
um, not, there's only like a handful of people, I guess, that teach it in the world. And so, um, we're, we're honored and excited to be putting that out there. Uh, that's in February. And you're teaching it with? With Bill Ray and, um, Sandy okay. Ray and, um, Skip Atwater is going to be wow. joining us. So, um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I got to get these guys out there teaching while they still are around. So I've been pestering Bill <laughs> to, um, to pass this stuff on to a new generation. So he's been great. And then March, I've and this got is for John, huh? I'm sorry. The ERV course is only for experienced remote viewers. Yeah, have to have some remote viewing experience. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, you won't have any idea what we're talking about. But uh, a little the class it does, with you don't John have to be you don't have anybody. to be a uh, you know a world class remote viewer, but you have to have some background to understand the process. Okay. Uh, there's there's room the in the online one. Uh huh. That's online. Great. But they are going to get the same. This is an intensive course. This is an intensive course. Anybody who's ever studied remote viewing with one of the uh, one of the original guys, you know, it's an all day. It, it, Paul Smith will teach from eight in the morning till eight at night. Uh, we're not going that that hard, but eight nine in the morning to six at night, something like that. And the online people will be involved with all of it, so they're going to get the whole. <laughs> they're going to get the whole uh, intensive program you know, just at a distance. So um, that is uh, going to be happening just in a couple of weeks here. And um, then we have the thing with John in March. And then the big one, another big one, um, two, one is Lily Dale. So I'm going to Lily Dale my first time. <laughs> So Amazing. I'm speaking at Lily Dell in July, and um, we are going to do something that's totally out of their comfort zone. Um, they're super excited about it. But uh, instead of standing up there and just talking about myself and my stories and, and all of that, we are going to do a um, an interactive sort of thing where... Um, Somebody's going to go missing while we're in Lilydale, <laughs> and um, <laughs> my assistant's going to go missing, and uh, and then the whole group is going to uh, do uh, what we can to see if we can locate her uh, in Lilydale, and then we're going to do like a uh, almost like a a clue game, you know, to make it fun to do a a, <laughs> a live kind of who done it kind of thing, like almost like a murder mystery thing. So we are going to do <laughs> that. Like detectives. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do the psychic detective thing, but we're going to make it fun. Um, and that will be live in Lilydale on, uh, it's up on their website. I think that's July 20th. And then I'm doing a live workshop on the 21st there. And then. Um, Amazing. That's going to be so fun. I'm really excited about that. And because um, I'm fairly new to the East coast, I'm going to go see Niagara Falls after because I've never been. Oh, so, nice. Uh, since I'm up there, I'm going to go uh, see Niagara Falls. And then um, I just confirmed, just confirmed yesterday that I'm going to be doing the cruise, IRVA, uh, the International Remote Viewing Association is doing a cruise this year. So I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be doing the cruise. So that'll be, that'll be fun. It sounds amazing. Um, I'm laughing because uh, one of the other students who works with Lynn Buchanan regularly emailed and said, oh, I hope everybody's going on this cruise. And I said, I'm so sorry. I can't do boats. <laughs> I, I said the same thing. I said the same thing because last time I got on a cruise, I got sick. I was sick. I missed <laughs> most of it because I was Laying in my cabin, um, they gave me something and that knocked me out. And I slept for like two days and woke up oh. and we were somewhere in the Caribbean, you know. But um, <laughs> um, 
but I, I learned about these bracelets. They have these yes. acupuncture bracelets and they actually do work. And so I'm going to walk on there with my bracelets, one on each wrist <laughs> to go Ginger with my, candy. my outfit and um, probably avoid uh, pina coladas and stuff like that. So, <laughs> So hopefully I'll have a better, hopefully I'll have a better go of it this time, but uh, we'll see. Oh, fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will put in the show notes links to your website and to any specific things coming up. Just to recap, the, the thing that people really need to get on ASAP is the extended remote viewing or ERV yeah. training in um, February. So just in a few weeks, but in March, you're doing the online uh, clairvoyance training, a one day training with John Holland, and, yeah. and you have the best chemistry together. It's going to be amazing. Um, you have Lilydale, which anybody who's has any interest in mediumship knows that Lilydale is kind of like the home yeah. of, um, you know, the historic home of mediumship, I feel like in the United States or one of them. Yeah. And I've heard incredible things about it. Have never been, but maybe soon. Um, and um, and then the Irva cruise. So lots of good things. Also, people can book readings with you on your website. Yep. Um, we've done it. Honestly, you've been so helpful. We're on the third house and like six years and thank you pam because yeah. <laughs> i was i was losing hope for a little while yeah <laughs> but here yeah. we are living proof that it works um but people can really learn to develop their own intuitive gifts with you anyone can do that and um yeah have a lot of fun while they do it so yeah. is there anything pam that i should have asked about that i didn't or that you want to share before i let you get back to your life of teaching and fighting crime <laughs> teaching and fighting crime and chasing my dogs around um, well <laughs> right. we are going to have to or have a conversation Sasha. about like, the house because I, I'm not up on the, the latest one <laughs> so um, but um, just one one thing I think we left dangling there is the ERV that people don't really know what that even means um, and what that what that is is a form of remote viewing where um, you have one person who's the viewer and then you have a person who's a monitor and the monitor um, sort of guides you along you just relax and get into the zone and they guide you along and and um, help you pull out the information that's needed from uh, from the session that you're doing and so um, just so people want to know what ERV actually is, but that's what, uh, that's what ERV is. Absolutely. And, it, and it, as you mentioned, it's a rare opportunity to learn something that is very separate and different and beyond the, the regular remote viewing training, which is also pretty great. Um, um, and a really important psychic discipline. Um, Thank you. So I'm so super excited for and you. Chat with you, and I love the snow in the background. It's so hot. Ah, it's thank very you. Hot. Yeah, <laughs> so great to be with you, Pam. Yeah. Um. So I'll refer people in the show notes, but I want to thank you again for spending time with me. Um. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, and thank you for all you do. Yep. My pleasure. So this has been another episode of Unpacking Possibility. For more information about Pam Coronado, you can go to her website, pamcoronado.com. And as always, if you enjoy the show, please remember to like, share, and follow. Leave me a comment. It helps me to continue bringing more great content to you. And as always, until next time, be well.